the young lads that worked with us, they are not driven by money necessarily. They, everybody has a drive to get a great salary, but they know, again, that's what we offer them in terms of the nature of the work itself is unique. And they really love that. And they see their friends in different companies hating their jobs every day. And that's something we're super proud of. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Derico Breakfast Bar. Here we speak with different people involved in the business landscape, share their expertise, delve into the latest tech trends, and explore the ins and outs of IT outsourcing. I'm Alex Sadikov, and today I'm excited to have Johan Izertel, CEO and co-founder at Move Ahead. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss new episodes. Hi, Johan, and thanks for joining me today. Hey, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start our podcast with a little blitz. I start a sentence and you continue. For sure, go ahead. I'm ready. Entrepreneurship gave me... Freedom. Entrepreneurship deprived me... Time. My main superpower is... Creativity. My main weakness is... Patience. When I'm afraid, I... I think. Nice. Very fast answers. Usually people think a lot on this section. I love those kind of things. They just like stimulate the brain the best way, you know? You have a strong academic background in behavioral neuroscience and human movement science. How did that transition into developing motion analysis software? It was kind of an organic kind of transition. I really enjoy research and I still do. So we still do a lot of research and development in Move Ahead. So we haven't lost that core part of what I was doing very well as an academic. And as a transition, it was frustrations in some parts from all the papers that we wrote. The impact on the science community was quite impressive, but doesn't really impact the community or the kids at scale. And that was one of the main reasons when we realized there is technology that could allow me to translate all the science that I have and put them in the hands of kids and family. That's why we started thinking, hang on a second, if there's something there in the commercial world, let's explore it. And we've been very fortunate in Ireland. We are supported by Enterprise Ireland that gave me the opportunity to do that kind of transitions, explore market opportunities and see if there is commercial tractions. When I realized they were there, Then we just left, you know, and that's what I said about your first question for the Blitz. The entrepreneurship gave me that freedom to explore things the way I really wanted and scale up, something I couldn't do as an academic. Interesting. What inspired you to start Move Ahead? Was there a personal moment or realization that sparked the idea? I think it's both. I really love working with children in general and impact their life. That's what I've been doing for like 17 plus years as academics who develop programs and really enjoy doing this and see the impact it has on them. And then there's this kind of associate as well, where we know society is not doing things that we used to, having fun, having playtime, engaging in physical activity and has a kind of negative effect on health. So that's really the main driver towards those kind of things that just, we blend all of that together and we made the company out of that. What were some of the biggest technical challenges in developing Move Ahead's motion analysis software. But we are really on the kind of the edge of what technology can offer, really, because nobody has ever done those kind of complex models baked in into a mobile mobile device with real time feedback, real time support for the kids and the family. So that's a very massive challenge for us to find a way to provide not only accurate support for the families, but also, as I said before, Oleg, the scalability of Move Ahead is something important to me. So. If the last things I want to do is having kids that only have an iPhone 16 Pro that can use the solution, that's exactly against the thing. So this is a, it's adding an extra layer of complexity to make sure it works both on Android and iOS, but also on old devices. With the third layer of complexity that you want to offer that offline to kids in case they don't have internet, don't have access to internet, or they have a very old phone that the parents don't want them to be connected it still works. It was some massive challenge that we accepted to take. We took them, worked, and that's why we managed to do that. Ahead combines gaming with physical movement. How did you design the user experience to be both fun and effective? And that's back to one of your Blitz questions, the creativity part. Not only as an academic, I can analyze the behavior, the bar mechanics, understand the psychology behind it and the neuroscience, but you combine this with kind of game design expertise. And my co-founder, Jamie McGann, has the PhD in computer science, computer vision also. But we always translated this knowledge into practical settings. So we wrote papers on how to design games that are effective. So that's this combination that is quite unique and that we have managed to put together. And the company, you know? Usually analysis and creativity stays apart. Yeah, yeah. 
But you know, from my PhD itself, it's in behavioral neuroscience, but I was working with contemporary dancers all the time. So art and science is something I've been doing since 2003 on a daily basis. So that's kind of becomes the second nature and we are creating things for the kids thinking the way they think, which is right. So that's the fun part and creating something for them and with them. So the co-design is core and then we combine that with the science and the technology. Um, Based on your example, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs looking to bring deep tech solutions to market successfully? I think passion is key mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's such a difficult thing to do. Like it's not for everybody. Clearly, it's something we, yeah, you just dream to build your company. And when you're building it, you keep asking yourself, why did I do that? But if you ask me to do it again, I'll probably do it, you know, because it's something that I love creating. So creating a company from scratch where nothing existed before was something I really enjoy and still growing it, you know. We went from zero to like 10 employees in two years time. So it's a slow progress, very controllable progress and process to grow the company. So yeah, passion, I think is key. And one thing I was you were laughing when you were asking me for the blitz things, you know, I'm not very patient by nature. So I want to go faster. So I do learn that things take time, you know, and I have to be patient because it takes a long time to build partnership with clients. We manage to attract very large corporates working with us. And you can, you know, like corporates don't move as fast as a startup. We are very agile and we can move very fast. They are not so agile. <laughs> so we have to learn that part on the patients and also like the technology never behave the way you wanted to dream, you know? So that's fascinating for me to solve all those problems. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the two advice I would say. Yeah, patience and passion. What role do AI and data analysis play in improving movement-based learning experience? Yeah, it's, it's basically the, it's a deep tech company. So we are fully working with AI models, the last like state of the art machine learning models. So it's on a daily basis that we are building models or refining models just to use them again on the mobile phone. So the data analytics part, we have like five guys like working every single day on that just to refine model, increase accuracy, increase rendering, sampling rates, all those kind of aspects. So yeah, we, it's, it's kind of interesting having this AI boom where everybody talks about it. We've been using those models for years, you know. Now it's mainstream things, but like to us, it's our bread and butter, and it's where we have been growing since, I don't know, 15 years or so. How do you see AI shaping your industry? Like, if you ask me for computer visions in general, it's, it's again, it's, it's more than shaping. It defines it because okay. it's part of it. Those models, there's dozens of people building new models, stronger, faster models, working on edge devices. We do a lot of things on cloud computing as well, depending on the type of analytics that we need to do. So yeah, we're combining both. It's yeah, it's center of every single thing we do. Like you shut down the models, there's no company. So that's why we are building our own proprietary software so just to be fully independent and work the way we want to make them. So this is not going to disappear anytime soon. It's just getting stronger and stronger um, and easier to use. How do you approach hiring and building a team that aligns with Mosaheads vision? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a struggle for startups. You know, like people say in Dublin, in Ireland, it becomes like a mini Silicon Valley because every single HQ for the main companies are in Dublin, where we are based. So there is multinational that will attract mm -hmm. talent, pay them very large salaries beyond what you can imagine. So to attract uh, the same talent in our company, you have to bring them with passion, the way I was describing what... Mm -hmm. I'm doing and the guys that we have in our team are passionate about this kind of unique gaming and analytics experience that we can offer that no one else can offer which is fantastic for us because they love their job and it's not just a job and also they know if they leave to find a job with a similar spec is close to impossible so that's the only way we can fight against the giant corporates you know, we have Meta and Google and Microsoft HQ all based like just beside us. So <laughs> it's not easy, but it's a good challenge. And the talent pool is quite fantastic in Ireland. So it does help as well. I compensate a little bit with the competition with the, the corporates. Are there specific regions or countries that you find particularly promising for tech talent? Oh, you mean regions outside Ireland? Yeah. That's the thing. So far, we are doing everything in-house just to build that product because the remote hiring has been proven challenging just to just for them to understand what we do. And there's a lot of brainstorming, creativity part, as I mentioned before, that goes beyond simply the tech. So I think when we grow, I think we'll be able to have a team overseas. And so far, we haven't really just explored it too far, too much. 
to to me eastern europe with like ukraine or portugal are two hubs that are very good mixed combined talents which is very hard to find on kind of tech arts and gaming or at least tech and gaming together there is a great great pool of talent there i think so I've explored it slowly but surely, you know, uh, just anticipate futures needs, but didn't act on it yet. Based in Dublin, do you know there's any unique challenges or opportunities in the tech industry in your region compared to other parts of the world? The part that I think really resonates with the previous point I made about having all the tech giant in Ireland, it brings the college to be very reactive. So these graduates that are absolutely amazing locally, there's like four universities in Dublin and all of them are pulling tech right left and center every year so that helps a lot the challenge that creates is the booming industry in ireland if i were to move somebody from spain or even let's say like ukraine or wherever the cost of living here it's quite striking and it's hard to believe until you just land and like and realize how difficult it is but that's always i guess you know economic boom the employment rate is very high so it's employment not unemployment but yeah so the it's quite striking like city to live in so a lot of pharma companies have moved to the West Coast just to continue growing and see what Ireland can offer. Dublin has a very big challenge for housing and everything, but it's growing and it's getting better. Maintaining an in-house development team can be challenging. What strategies have you employed to effectively manage and nurture its internal development? Well, like everyone in our company is part of it, you know, we have shared with all our employees, we're sharing what we are growing. The better we grow, the better it is for everybody. So that's one kind of way for us to yeah, to motivate them to stay a bit longer. But I think the young lads that work with us, they are not driven by money necessarily. They, everybody has a drive to get a great salary, but they know, again, that's what we offer them in terms of the nature of the work itself is unique. And they really love that. And they see their friends in different companies hating their jobs every day. And that's something I'm super proud of because they know every day it will be a challenge, but a challenge that shows themselves, a challenge they love. And I'm just there to help them, to make them shine and show how incredible they are. It's a blessing having those guys with us because it's, it's, it's not easy. But we do attract bright people, you know? So, and it's not everybody is made for startups. You know, you ask me, like for me as what I love as an entrepreneur, working as an employee in a startup is a bit crazy as well. It's not for everybody. If somebody wants like a structured jobs, that have a clear milestone and pipeline for the next like three months. That's not the startup life, you know, it doesn't happen this way. So again, it doesn't suit everyone. So all those guys are not coming to us, but those that come, it's, they know exactly what's going to happen and they really think it's good. Reflecting on your business operations, are there specific tasks or projects that you believe could potentially benefit from outsourcing? Yeah, I think it's once you grow quick in parts, so if you have a giant client, it could be I'm sourcing a part of a design for a backend architecture or ten that needs to be built quite rapidly, and then potentially to sustain that team over time. That's something always you keep an eye on. So yeah, no, the outsourcing is something you want to just envisage. It's the locations, the time zones, language buyer. I'm French myself, so I can really appreciate. But it's not so sometimes super easy to translate, you know, technical challenges to a team that is not English speaking. So that's always something to keep an eye on. Specifically, when you're working from an English-speaking country, it doesn't help in that sense because you have the whole team that could go full on and very quickly. And that's something to keep an eye on. The Spanish team working with someone in Romania it could be easier. Two broken English discussions sometimes is easier than one fluent person. So that's always something to keep an eye on as, yes, from being established in an English-speaking country. But yeah, to answer your question directly, it's something yeah, everybody do consider it. It's not something easy to do. As we wrap up our conversation, drawing from your experience, what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs or individuals looking to disrupt traditional industries with innovative technology solutions? Hmm. An advice for those guys? Yeah, you just have to believe in yourself, I think, the most importantly, because everyone around you, when you talk to investors, clients, they will make you doubt because they see worlds in a different ways. So you don't have to be stubborn, but in some ways you have to know something that you believe strongly that is true maybe you're wrong but at least it makes you move forward because if you keep listening to everybody constantly with different opinions it's quite disruptive so it's a fine balance you know a very fine balance show that you can listen and learn while also move forward with your own rational your own logic 
I think we're very good at this, at listening, because as academics, I think it helps because you have to listen and teach people. So we do listen well, but also I just have to keep going, you know, <laughs> because everybody has opinions and different visions. So it's like you just have to take everything into account and, and do something about it. Thank you very much, Johan. I really appreciate your time. It was great communication, very positive communication. I really enjoyed the vibe. Hope everyone else will, will do the same. Yeah, thank you for chatting with you, Oleg. It was a great pleasure. If you enjoy our discussion and want to stay updated on the future episodes, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you will not miss out on the latest insights and conversations from the Direco Breakfast Bar. See you in the next episode.